<gasps> Zelda Blade Chronicles 1 is a masterpiece! Originally released in June 2010 in Japan and August 2011 in Europe and September 2011 in Australia and April 2012 in North America after we all signed a bunch of petitions, Xenoblade 1 is my third favorite game of all time and in this video I'm going to talk about why it's a dope game for dope people. It's hard for me to describe why a game is good other than saying, you see this? This is good. But I will describe what the game is for those who haven't played it and hopefully that'll be enough to explain why it's good. And since it's being remade for the Switch, and that'll be a lot of people's first time ever playing it, this video will be very light on spoilers. There will be spoilers in terms of gameplay mechanics, but no story spoilers past the first hour or two, and even then I'm gonna keep it kinda vague. Trust me, I know this game really well, I'm not gonna reveal anything that would potentially damage someone's experience with this game, unlike Smash Brothers goes out of its way to do! Also, I streamed the remake for like 11 hours or so, so if you want, you can rewatch that and see the first chunk of the game, but with good graphics. But since I had to suffer through the original Wii graphics for 200 hours, so do you for this video. Part 1, the setting, and what do I think the story is? So there's two moon-sized giants, the Bionis, that was the people planet with nature and stuff, and the Mechonis, the machine planet, it's got machines, and they don't like each other. It's like Coca Mentos or Xenoblade 2 in good gameplay, they don't mix. And each one has little things living on them, like Clownfish on an, 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 an enemy, or Slum on LeBron James, and they fight each other too. It's people versus the machines, the machines are called the Mechon. The Mechon are really difficult to fight, except there's a magic sword that I'm sure many of you have heard of called the Monado. We have the Monado. Your buddy can't take any more of the Monado. It's the Monado! I'll oh, just come and get the Monado! And it's really good at taking out the machines. It's also the sword that the Bionis used, except like, smaller? Uh, and it's explained in the game, I'm not gonna explain to hear this video series are too long. But that's how the game starts. It sets up the easy to follow plot. People vs machines living on giants. And then puts you right into the action and give you tutorials on the basics of how the battle system works and really easy fights because you have the weapon that's really effective against the machines. It's a good way to start a video game. After that battle, the game jumps forward one year and you play as Shulk. He's a little twink who studies the Monado. And big beefcakey himbo Ryan who's his best friend. And then the game teaches you more about the battle system and your bread and butter combo, break and topple. Where Shulk uses a move to put the enemies to a break state and Ryan, who's completely AI controlled, uses an art to make them fall over. And they can't attack and all your moves do buko damage on him. Ryan says this in a cutscene and then the game shows you pictures on how to do it and then they give you an easy enemy to practice it on. And then the game gives you an area to walk through towards your next destination you can practice the battle systems more since it's not like most RPGs. Part 2. The beginning of the game. Even though I didn't like the beginning of the game the first time I played it, the beginning of the game is really well designed, and I was just dumb. It just took some getting used to compared to other RPGs I played. You go back to Shulk's lab where he studies the Monado and talk to Dixon, by the way, that's Dixon. And they talk about, hey, the Monado's really hard to control, it has some hidden powers, and it can't hurt people, and only Dunban from the beginning of the game can control it, sort of. And even when he used it at the battle at the beginning of the game, it fucked him up real bad. Also, Shulk touches the Monado at one point and has a weird vision of stuff throughout the rest of the game. Four. Shadowy. Then Ryan and Shulk get a simple quest to go fill up some ether containers in a cave. Then Fiora joins the party and the gang goes through a cave, giving you more chances to try out the battle system, now with three party members, and you're immediately in lock chain attacks. Sure would suck if you had to wait like 5 or 10 or 15 hours to use three party members in chain attacks in a battle system that's clearly designed for three party members in chain attacks, huh? At the end of the cave, you get to a cliff, then you see some machines attacking your home, and you're like, oh shit. And the game's like, hey, just jump off the cliff, there's water down there, it's fine. Teaching the player that if you see water, you can just jump and land on it and you won't take fall damage. And then you run back to town into the attack and the game's like, Hey, remember that break and topple combo that we taught you and gave you plenty of time to learn? Well, guess what? The only way you can reliably damage the Mechon is by doing that combo. And it's hard fighting the Mechon because it's supposed to be for story reasons. You're supposed to feel like it's a desperate situation. You only do one damage to them and the game tells you, Hey, you can just run by enemies and sometimes, like this time, running away may be your best option. Run. And you run through the enemies to get Dumban the Monado from the lab, but then the lab where the Monado was stored is blocked, and Shulk and Ryan are like, Oh, fuck. We're back. And then Dumban shows up, 
with the Monado or Rex, everyone in the cutscene, and then I got a huge boner for him, and then he joins the party and Rex, everyone in the actual battle, and you're all like, oh hell yeah, Monado's dope as hell. And then you go back through the enemies you just had to run through like a pussy ass bitch, and the Monado helps you whoop their ass. And you, the player, is all like, god damn, this thing's real good at whooping robot ass. That's how you do good theming in a video game. Fighting one mech on is really difficult in gameplay. So when the characters are surrounded by them, there's actual tension here. Then it feels super satisfying once Dumban shows up with the Monado to take out multiple mechon in gameplay. You go back through all the mechon you just had to run through a second ago and easily put the smack down on them. <laughs> But then Dunban gets sick because the Monado is too much for him to take, just like in the flashback at the start of the game, and even throws up blood on screen. And Ryan's all like, oh, oh, that ain't, that ain't normal, you might want to get that checked out. And Shulk is like, now it's Shulk time. And he picks up the Monado and just like at the start of the game, he starts tripping balls. But nope. Turns out with the Monado, Shulk can see the future and use that knowledge to dodge attacks and change the future. And guess what? You can do that during gameplay too. The game will tell you when there's a real powerful attack coming and how much time you have until it comes and you can use that knowledge to dodge attacks and change the future. That'd be real dumb if you only had visions during cutscenes and not during the gameplay, wouldn't it? Anyways, after fighting more Mechon with Shulk using the Monado, Metal Face shows up. He's like a powerful Mechon, but for some reason the Monado doesn't work on it. Even with the Monado, you're only doing one damage on it during the boss fight. Foreshadowing. And Metal Face kills people. And since Shulk has been using the Monado for like two minutes, he has a vision of people dying, but he's not able to stop it. And he's all like, oh, these motherfuckers can come into my house, kill my people, drink my Kool-Aid. I'm gonna use this magic sword, go out and cap their ass. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So that's the plot setup. All of it's done in like an hour or two. Shulk and Ryan go on a quest for revenge against the Mechon so they stop attacking people. It clearly sets up the character's motivations by having you play through it. And along the way, Shulk gets better at using the Monado and unlocks more Monado powers. Which brings me to... Part 3. The Battle System. So unlike a lot of other RPGs where you walk through the world and occasionally the game goes whoosh 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 and your squad lines up on one side, the enemies line up on the other side and you start whacking each other. No, instead you see a monster and you start fighting them right then and there in the game world. And instead of a turn based combat, the game instead has MMO style combat where you have auto attacks every couple of seconds and you set up up to 8 special techniques called arts that are on different cooldown timers. Each character has different arts and different arts do different things. Some of them are support buffs, some are enemy debuffs. Some of them are offensive attacks that do more damage depending on where you're standing so you can freely move around and get into position and plan your next move. There's also the talent art in the middle of the arts palette and it's different for each character and instead of on a timer it charges up by doing a certain number of auto attacks. For Shulk, the character that most players will be controlling for the whole game, it's how he uses his special Monado moves and with Ryan it's how he draws a lot of aggro. And similar to MMOs, fighting enemies is all about drawing aggro. The enemies are going to choose to attack whatever character they deem is the biggest threat so you gotta make sure they're attacking the characters that can take the hits, mainly Ryan since he's the tank, which fits his character since he's all very protective of little Twiggy Boy Shulk. There's the tension meter, which, long story short, the more you're really feeling it, the better you do in combat. And there's the party gauge up top that has three slots that gradually fill up during combat. You can spend one slot to revive a party member, or if you have all three slots filled up, you can do a chain attack where each party member uses an art and you can chain them together depending on what type of art. This also lets you directly select what move your AI controlled party members use. Other than chain attack, and vision warnings, the AI controls your other party members during combat. Other than choosing which arts they have equipped, there's not a ton of strategy in deciding what your allies do, but for the most part, they're smart enough. Except controlling Melia, they're not the best good doing that. I used to think she wasn't that good, but then I controlled her directly and realized, oh, uh, she's actually really good, the AI is just kinda, kinda suboptimal with her. The battle system does take a lot of getting used to, and honestly, at least for my first playthrough, it didn't really get good for me until Charlotte joins the party about two or three hours in, since she's a dedicated healer, and your party now has traditional traditional roles of tank, healer, and DPS. Up until then, for healing, you only had Choke's light heal, which is honestly, <laughs> pretty bad! Part 4. What's the gameplay? So I talked about the story, I talked about the battle system, but what's playing the game actually like? Well, for one, it's big. Like, big. 
It really is like a single player MMO in that there's so much shit in this game. And it's all pretty good shit. It's designed in such a way you can play the game in any way you want. You want to go straight through the amazing story? You can do that. In fact, there's an arrow at the top of the screen that points to how many steps away from the next objective you are. The characters are all well written and well acted. This is one of the best English dubs of all time. A game with 10 plus hours of cutscenes would falter if the acting fell flat, but in this game, it very much does not do that. And the story really feels like it has actual stakes, and the villains act in such a way that makes you want to fight them. And there's plenty of twists and turns in the story, you always want to see what's going to happen next. So my first playthrough, I blazed through the story since it was so interesting. This is how I usually play games and do a couple side quests along the way. Speaking of which, you want to interact with NPCs and do a lot of side quests? You could do that! There's over 200 quests in this game. There's a development screen where you can do quests and unlock more quests for that area. There's a relationship screen where you can see how all the NPCs know each other. You know that Terrytown quest chain from Breath of the Wild where you build up the town and recruit villagers living it? Yeah, Xenoblade 1 did that too, but like 7 years earlier and way more expansive. And now that I'm doing it again on the remake, I forgot how annoying some of it can be to be quite honest with you. And that plays ties into the story later, and even though building the town is completely optional, all the work you put in makes it feel way more significant if you did it. You want to explore a big old game world and find stuff? You can do that. You find a new area, you get experience points. This is one of those games where if you see it, you can go to it, and there's always something to find. Oh look, that's a nice looking river down there. It'd be cool to head over down there. Yay! Oh, that's a nice looking island down there. Be cool to head over there. Yeet! And there's always stuff to find. Rare crystal spots, unique monsters, rare weapons and armor. There's all sorts of stuff. And you're motivated to keep exploring by these little blue crystals that litter the world. They're all just common items, and you just pick it up and keep going. You don't even break stride. That'd be pretty stupid if you had to stop every 20 feet to pick up items in a game with a heavy focus on exploration. The gameplay loop here is so satisfying. You explore and find ether deposits that you mine and refine into ether crystals. Your party members that have a better bond in combat refine them into better gems, which makes them do better in combat. You have ether crystals on your armor to improve your character's stats. There's a whole lot of slots, so you have a ton of options on how you want to build your characters. It'd be real dumb if you only had like two or three slots. You then use your improved characters to go explore and fight stronger enemies and get better stuff. And then the more you battle, the closer your characters get. The characters can cheer each other on during combat and get a deeper bond with each other, which lets you unlock heart to hearts between them and learn more about them, which further increases their bond and lets you do even better in combat and fight stronger enemies and make more powerful gems. Now here's a final list of things worth mentioning about Xenoblade Chronicles 1. Some of them I didn't know where else to put in the video, and some of them will be, uh, let's just say really important in a future episode in this series. First off, the music in this game is fucking phenomenal. This composition team is stacked! And now to butcher some Japanese names, sorry in advance. Yoko Shimamura, who has, among other things, done the soundtrack to Final Fantasy XV and a lot of the Kingdom Hearts games. Yasunori Mitsuda, who's done a lot of Square Enix RPGs, including Chrono Trigger, aka the best game ever made. Ace Plus! You know that Gangplank Galleon remix from Smash Ultimate that everyone drains their nugs for? They made that. And they also did the Beneath the Mask remix from Persona 5 Smash Ultimate tracks that I'm told is really special? I don't know. So imagine a game OST where they did a lot of the songs. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be pretty fucking fantastic, wouldn't it? Sometimes you'll fight souped up regular enemies and literally the greatest song in human existence played! Another thing, the battle dialogue makes sense and isn't annoying. It works wonders to endear you to the characters. Tutorials have pictures and you can reread them at any time in the game. 
There isn't any win in the gameplay, lose in the cutscene. If you're not supposed to defeat an enemy yet, then the battle will just end early. Cutscenes are quick and complement the gameplay well. They're not overindulgent, they don't show you 10 cutscenes in a row, and there's plenty of subtle foreshadowing in plain sight that you might not notice on a first playthrough. But when you replay the game, which I did immediately after I beat it the first time, I was like, oh my god, I didn't know that before, it's so subtle, it's genius. The serious parts are serious, funny is funny, emotional is emotional, and that's because of good writing and good acting. You don't know which visions are going to come true and which won't, which creates tension in every scene. Best loading screen of all time in gaming, it's so simple and relaxing, I could watch it for hours. Equipment changes your appearance, so you're not looking at the same stupid outfit for 100 hours, you're looking at a bunch of stupid outfits for 100 hours. Places have simple names, so it's easy to follow. The game features streamlined design, doesn't waste your time. The game even tells you if a quest is limited time only due to story reasons because fuck it, it's a video game. They make design decisions that benefit the player's experience. The game has a diverse cast of characters of different complexions, not like in most JRPGs where it's just like, anime white people. You're never required to level grind to progress normally through the story. As long as you don't skip too many of the enemies around your level in between you and the next story objective, you're good. But if you do like level grinding, each area has some tougher optional enemies you can fight if you want or come back later and fight them. You start each battle with all your arts ready to go and battles are generally pretty quick. You pick up items without stopping and there's a collectopedia where you register your items you pick up in each area and get rewards. There's also a personopedia so you can view all the NPCs you meet and how they all connect, and it tells you if an NPC moves, what time of day they're around, and what items they have for trading. And the more somewhere likes you because you did a lot of quests, the more quests you unlock. And you don't have to go turn in the simpler quest whoever you got them from, so long as you fought however many monsters or collected however many items, and as soon as you fulfill the requirements, they just auto-complete. Visions tell you what items are needed for quests, even quests you haven't accepted or unlocked yet, so you don't accidentally get rid of them. Part 6 is it a perfect game? No. To be fair, here's a bunch of the game's shortcomings. Even by Wii standards, the graphics aren't the greatest, especially when compared to games like Mario Galaxy. Xenoblade 1 looks like a good looking PS2 game, but at least the sky is really pretty in a lot of areas at night. That being said, Given the processing power of the Wii and the size and scale of this world, some concessions had to be made to render everything. I'd rather a larger scale world with mediocre graphics than a smaller one with higher resolution graphics, but that's just me. But again, the game was remade for the Switch with great graphics, so it doesn't even matter that much anymore. The first regular battle theme sucks. I'm sorry, it's a bad song, y'all. There's no discernible melody or flow. It's just instruments making noise. Luckily, the battles are pretty short and boss themes are really good, and part way through the game it gets replaced by mechanical rhythm anyway. Also, the remake redid the song and now it sounds really great. Ricky's introduction to the party completely derails the game's grounded tone and pacing. He felt like very forced comic relief, and I immediately benched him for a big chunk of the game. But he grew on me over time since he's actually a really well-written character. The agility stat is super broken. If you stack a bunch of it, you can just dodge everything. The menu interface is a bit of a mess to navigate. You get used to it over time and, and what is that sound? Video games, munch munch munch. Video games, munch munch munch. Welcome back to another episode of Snack and Gamer, where our passions are video games and food. Today we're looking at Xenoblade Chronicles 1 on the Wii. How easy is it to eat during this game? Well, there's plenty of load screens during fast traveling and cinematic cutscenes where you can just eat some popcorn while you watch. For a rating, I give this game a nice burger from a fancy restaurant where all of the parts taste amazing. Amazing storyline, amazing combat, amazing gameplay, amazing characters, amazing music, amazing voice acting. There might be a few bad parts. Who the fuck put sesame seeds on my burger? But just like a burger, the tiny kind of bad things don't matter because the core experience is amazing. It's amazing. It's... Xenoblade 1 is really, really good. Really, 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 real good. All you fuckers better get the remake. Every time I play this game, I get fully erect. So how do you follow up on one of the greatest games of all time? By doing something completely different. So next episode, we'll be looking at the follow-up, Zettelmade Chronicles X on the Wii U.